I wanted to thank Margot and Donna and the rest of the folks at the NCCAH for inviting me to present on this very important topic. I'd also like to thank all of you who have taken the time out of your day uh, to participate and listen to some of the thoughts that we have had about this topic. I am here in Victoria, have been a grateful visitor here on the territory of the Coast Salish people for seven years. And again, I'm just I'm really thrilled to be able to talk about this important topic. I did want to say a bit of a words. Uh, I'm going to be using the term Aboriginal generally in the, in the presentation because it is the term currently used by the Public Health Agency of Canada and the National Collaborating Centre for Aboriginal Health. Uh, but I did want to acknowledge uh, that the term Indigenous is being used more frequently and is considered uh, more appropriate for a, an increasing number of people. So I wanted to start just by getting a few definitions clear and so that we're all on the same page. Race, the concept of race is a social construction of human difference and it's typically based on characteristics that are physical, skin color, hair texture and physical features. But along with those physical characteristics, racial categories have really evolved to include cognitive, moral and behavioral characteristics as well. The concept of racialization is more active. So this is the practice or the process of assigning a racial identity to a, a person or a group of people. Now that can include internal racialization, so that involves someone's own racial identity, their own sense of, of what race, this human construction of race that they belong to. Now, we're here to talk about racism, but I wanted to acknowledge that there are hundreds of isms, right, and so they represent either a philosophical or political or moral doctrines or belief systems, so things like Marxism or Buddhism would be considered philosophical and you know, religious or moral doctrines, but some definitions refer to prejudice or discrimination on the basis of a specific attribute. So rape, uh, sexism is another form of discriminatory Raceism. So racism generally is the belief that race, this human construction, is a primary determinant of human capacity, right? Racism can also be the practice of discriminating or feeling prejudiced or acting in a prejudiced way based on the socially constructed attribute of race. And you can see in this definition that it often includes this notion of what we would call ethnocentrism or racism in the sense that people believe that the racial category to which they have been assigned or assign themselves is superior to other racial categories. So we also know and we're very familiar with racism in its more relational form which is fear and hatred tolerance of those folks who have been racialized as different than oneself, uh, but also I'm going to talk a lot today about structural racism. So that's defined as policies or systems of government and other systems that are based on this notion of a racial identity and fostering doctrines of race-based discrimination. So why do we have a social construction of race? Well, the concept of race was actually created by Europeans who were exploring and colonizing the globe. And as they encountered people who looked and behaved differently than themselves, they created new racial categories for those people. Uh, the belief that Europeans were superior to all other people manifests in this construction of racial hierarchy, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So that racial hierarchy always, in the, in the way that it's been constructed, 
puts European people at the top in every attribute that has been assigned to race. Racism persists partly because of the domination of European or Western knowledge systems that have actually promoted this belief that A, race actually exists and that there is some truth in the racial hierarchy that has been constructed. It also persists because, well really, it's a pretty effective way of validating colonization, resource appropriation, cruelty, discrimination, and, and all of the inequities that we see in folks who are racialized at lower levels of this hierarchy, including indigenous people. So the trajectory of racism, which I've tried to describe here in this model, begins, you can see, with this ideology or a belief that race is exists and that those racial categories can be understood in a hierarchy, right? And so those folks who are positioned at lower levels within that hierarchy, so that's everybody who's not of European ancestry, basically, the attributes that are attributed to those racial categories become belief systems or beliefs about those people and those groups, almost all negative, and then people are stereotyped. So stereotype meaning that people come to believe that every member of that racialized group has those characteristics. And so that becomes the basis of discrimination, right? So the unequal treatment of people who are determined to be within these racial categories and their relative position in that hierarchy, which leads to the inequities that we see now in almost all areas of indigenous life, from health to the economy to social justice and political self-determination. So I wanted to talk about the forms of racism, but I wanted to make sure that I acknowledge that Although, you know, folks have created these definitions for diverse forms of racism, but they don't occur in isolation from one another. They are, in fact, interrelated, and we can think of them as creating synergies of harm and disparity, right? So they permeate every element of human life and, well, every social system that we have. The first one I wanted to talk about was this notion of epistemic racism. So epistemic comes from the word epistemology. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. And so within the North American context and Canadian context, we have a domination of Western or Euro-Canadian knowledge systems, along with the disregard or devaluing of indigenous knowledge systems. This also means that resources are allocated to promoting and perpetuating those knowledge systems so that they become more dominant. Now relational racism is the form most people are familiar with. This is things like verbal abuse and violence and but it doesn't just include that. Relational racism can also include things like you know, well-meaning but insulting remarks like, well, you don't look native, or, oh, you speak really well, or, oh, your people must be very proud of you, things like that. It also can include avoiding contact with indigenous people, either within your friendship group, whether you, you know, work with or interact with indigenous people that you work with, whether it's that you, the salesperson you might choose in a store, whether or not that person is indigenous. I am going to talk a little bit later about structural racism, but I did want to just talk a little bit about this notion of exclusion. And so typically we talk about social exclusion, and what that really refers to is the process of isolating people, in this case indigenous people, from the equal participation in and contribution to economic, educational, political, and health systems and structures. And again, I'm going to talk a little bit more, quite a bit more detail about that in a few moments. Now, symbolic racism is an interesting 
form uh, definition. This is a concept that is fairly new and it's really an attempt to try to identify those folks who, while they aren't overtly racist, they don't practice sort of overt forms of relational racism, you know, they abhor the violence of that kind of racism, but they are also opposed to equity-based initiatives because they believe that Indigenous people no longer face much discrimination. So they talk about colonization and, and racism as a thing of the past. They also believe that the Indigenous people experience disparities because they are just not trying hard enough, right? They have a sort of a bootstrap mentality, you know, where they, which supposes that there is a cool playing field which we know is not accurate. They often will make remarks about Indigenous people being too demanding, you know, having gotten all that they deserve, things like that. And so the next form, color blind, or some people call this blind racism. Now this form of racism is perpetuated by people who believe that we should not consider racial categories because, as I said earlier, racism is a social construction. And in theory, that's true, but it ignores the fact that racialization does exist and that a racial hierarchy does perpetuate discrimination and inequalities. So, while we can agree that race is a social construction, we still have to address racism because it is a social reality. The last term that I've included here is embodied racism. The effects of racism, not just in these forms that I've talked about, but the ideology of race and the construction of a racial hierarchy, is, and the effects of that are experienced in the bodies of all racialized people. So for those who are relegated to the lower levels of the racial hierarchy, that effect is often detrimental to mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual health. Now, the research is clear that all forms of racism do direct harm to individuals, but they also create environments that are equally harmful to human health. Now moving along to structural racism, again, I've already mentioned this, but discrimination is not always expressed in really overt ways, like slavery, genocide, things like that. We often refer to structural determinants of health as root determinants because they are hidden from our view, but they are deep within the structures of our society, right? And so this is why the term structural racism is used. People actually rarely question or challenge the fact that the most powerful people, in this case Canada, are almost exclusively racialized as white and are males from privileged backgrounds. We also rarely question or challenge, or society rarely questions or challenge, because I'm certainly doing that today that the policies and the programs and the practices of our society almost always privilege members of those groups. So you see what I mean about root determinants and them being quite sometimes invisible to most people, taken for granted, feeling as though those things are somehow neutral, i.e. they're not intentional inequalities, and that they are natural because of a racial hierarchy. Now before I get into some of the specific examples of structural racism in Canada, I want to just unpack this first uh, sentence a little bit. So when we talk about economic institutions, we're talking about commercial organizations that generate, distribute, and purchase goods and services. Social institutions can include education, justice, religion, and then, of course, political institutions of federal, provincial, and municipal government. So all of these institutions, in practicing structural racism, can create racism by establishing, first of all, 
racist beliefs and establishing other forms of discrimination. Remember back in the first few definitions of racism, it also policy and the failure to alleviate discrimination is a form of racism by itself. They can also practice racism by performing these forms of discrimination and they reinforce racism by either ignoring or supporting other forms of racism. So, to the list here, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I think many of you are familiar with these structures, uh, but the Indian Act, by any definition, a racist act. It has legislated and continues to support multiple forms of anti-Indigenous or Aboriginal racism specific to First Nations people who have been designated as status Indians by the federal government. Indigenous communities, well, this structural racism perpetuated against Indigenous communities is really reflected in, first of all, the physical segregation of Indigenous people onto reserves and settlements and hamlets that are not, in, in almost every case, not conducive to their health and then the failure to acknowledge the consequence hardship of those locations or the reserve system and the failure to support those communities to overcome those hardships. We all are familiar with residential schools. They were based quite clearly on a racial hierarchy that determined Indigenous parents to be lacking in the capacity to take care of their children. They were supported by economic, social, and political institutions. And we know that they practiced, well, the most heinous and overt forms of racism and cultural genocide on children. We see over-policing of Indigenous peoples in arrests and certainly in sentencing. This is based on uh, racist stereotypes of Indigenous people as criminals. And in addition to that, it's based on a racist fear about a perceived threat of Indigenous people against mostly European people. The apprehension, which has been talked about since the 60s scoops, but the apprehension of Indigenous people by the state is really just a decentralized but equally racist version of the residential school system. I work a lot in healthcare systems and structural racism within this context has been reported. I mean, that there's a mass of literature that reports that Indigenous people face longer wait times, sometimes to their ultimate demise. They are referred much less frequently to specialist care when they are treated. And in general, they report disrespectful treatment within the healthcare system that not only demeans them as an individual and disempowers them, but also reflects a racist ideology about their identity, whether it's cultural or racialized identity, and then ultimately the well-being of that individual. Now, that was the bad news, <laughs> and uh, I did, uh, we did want to, and, and I want to acknowledge that there has been a lot of effort made to address racism in all of its different forms, right? And so the media has, you know, is increasingly mandating diversity within television, movies, and so on in an attempt to reduce some of the negative stereotypes about Indigenous people. They have attempted to reduce the social exclusion of Indigenous people by having greater representation, but also greater celebration of Indigenous peoples. And so, again, attempting to negate or provide an opposing view to some of those negative stereotypes that people have about Indigenous people. Uh, education is actually I would say it's starting to be a front runner in some of these initiatives in the sense that they are beginning at least to start to tell the true story of colonization, of colonialism, 
of the residential school system and some of the historical trauma and racism that Indigenous people have faced in Canada. They are attempting to create environments that are safe for Indigenous students and safe for Indigenous faculty and staff, and they are attempting to create anti-racist curriculum that not only celebrates the contribution of Indigenous peoples, but also addresses the different forms of racism, educates children about the fact that we live in a race-based society, and challenges some of those racist practices and, and policies. Within healthcare, the notion of cultural safety, which has evolved from other concepts like cultural competency, which is still used in some cases, cultural sensitivity. This is a process by which healthcare environments and increasingly professionals are attempting to consider the effect that that care and those environments is having on Indigenous people. So in, in many cases, in health professionals are being encouraged to consider how their racialized identity and their social position have actually shaped their practice with Indigenous people. And, you know, in terms of community-based and driven care, this is a, an attempt, again, to reshape the system through engaging Indigenous peoples and communities in determining what that care is going to look like. So there are other systems within the Canadian context that are governing things like social interactions as well as justice and employment practices. And this is again an attempt to reduce in many cases relational racism but also structural racism. So the Truth and Reconciliation, many of the recommendations coming out of that commission are structural in nature as are things like employment equity policies that are being, being initiated. So, you know, I, I'm wary to draw conclusions for all of you, but I guess what I would like to suggest is that we can agree on a few things, right? That racism perpetuated on an individual level does harm to that person, which in turn then affects that person's family and social group. I think we could agree on that. But what worries me more is racism perpetuated on a structural level because that kind of racism informs the institutions that we all engage with, right? This does harm to entire groups of racialized people and their descendants. So it creates a root system that is harmful to generations of people within racialized groups. I hope we can also agree that personal and structural discrimination against Indigenous peoples and communities and nation states has largely been justified through this socially constructed notion of race. So, well, what do we need to do? Well, I would suggest we can start by reducing racialized hostility toward Aboriginal people but really focusing our attention on those things that we know to be legally sanctioned discrimination that hinders Aboriginal people's uh, capacity to be healthy and self-determining. So we really do need to change these race-based policies that, and I'm hoping that this presentation has shown you and that the readings which are here on the on the panel, that those race-based policies have really attempted to fit not only physically but socially isolate Indigenous people, clearly attempt to culturally assimilate Indigenous people, and politically decimate nation states that prior to colonization were working really, really, really quite well. So I guess the bottom line is that change cannot happen in isolation of our relationship with non-Indigenous people. And so the problems have evolved in a society of people who are racialized as different, who are 
who have been situated within this racial hierarchy, the only way we can change this structure is by working together. That's why I've included this quote from the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, which was written almost 20 years ago. And so I think we're moving in the right direction, but I am really hopeful that we can continue these kinds of discussions in an open, respectful way so that we can, in the last sentence of this quote, we can lift the burden and collectively shift that for everyone. Thank you very much. I appreciate you listening to what I've had to say.